Good to see you. If you're joining us online, of course, we're glad that you have chosen Vineyard to come alongside us. And wherever you're at in the world, we love pr- talking about what God's doing in our lives and watching God change us and transform us. Well, we are going to be talking about that today. In fact, we're starting a new series that we're going to be going all the way through Lent, all the way to Easter, because God talks about transforming our lives in order for that to happen. Sometimes it takes a little bit of like meditating and soaking in what God has for us. So we're going to be doing that as we go through this series, The Art of Being Unordinary. Now look at this kind of our theme verse here. It's out of Romans. Romans 12 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. So there is a pattern. The the world would try to push you into their mold, into their pattern. But he says, instead, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So each of us have a choice to either be conformed or transformed. You can be conformed by your peers, by the pressures of media and movies and script writers and all and all the things that try to make you conform. But here's the thing is by definition, conforming means you're going to lose your uniqueness. God, you know, and everybody's different. Nobody here has the same fingerprint. Nobody has the same retina eye scan. Even twins. I mean, identical twins, different. Different heartbeat, rhythms. Everything about you is unique. And so the world wants to conf- make you conform and lose your uniqueness. God wants you to be who you are, who he made you to be, all of the unique gifts and passions and and insights, but be transformed, and he wants to do it by the renewing of your mind. God doesn't make clones. Man makes clones. God does not make clones because you are unique, and he wants to use you and your uniqueness to be transformed and also influence people around you. So the world has a lot of problems there's a lot of pressures and stressors in our lives. We can collapse from because of all of that and, 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 and kind of like just hide away or, or, or shy away. But God wants us to step into this world and make changes for good. But it begins with us. So that's why we're going to talk about goals today. In fact, we're really going to set a goal each week. So each week I'm going to talk to you about whether it's vocationally or relationally or spiritually or, or mentally. I mean, all these areas we're going to look up about setting goals. Why are goals important in my life? Well, one reason is goals are a spiritual responsibility. So you can follow along in your outline, but maybe you've never thought about this before. Maybe you thought, sometimes people think goals are just kind of like, well, those are for like athletes or for business executives or something. No, actually, goals are, they're a spiritual responsibility. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but you know, God sets goals. God has a goal for the universe. He has a goal we see in God, in, in, in the Bible. He has a goal for planet Earth. He has a goal for Jerusalem. He has a goal for your life, certainly. So God sets out goals. Jesus had goals. I don't know if you, if you look through the Gospels. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but he, has, he had a goal at, at 12, we're told, Age 12, he says, hey, I have a goal to be in God's word, to be in God's house, to be in prayer. And then he has a goal when he's, I I want, you know, 12 disciples, and he kind of sets that out. And then he declares goals in different phases of his ministry before he does certain things. We see him having goals. He announced them publicly. He has travel goals. He has ministry goals. He even has miracle goals. One of those, of course, would be the the cross. I mean, he announced that. That's one of that was one of his goals. Not just the cross, but the resurrection. And we see actually not just Jesus, but every great hero, every great person of faith in Scripture was a person of goals, and they set out and had goals. Paul, Apostle Paul's a great example of one of those people. Of course, he wrote the bulk of the New Testament. He says, "I know that I." Am not yet what God wants me to be. How many of you can say that? <laughs> I know that's me for sure, right? I'm not what God wants me to be yet, but 
I haven't reached that goal. That's a goal I'm a, I'm, I, I have set for myself. But I keep moving toward it to make it mine because Christ made me and saved me for this. God saved you so that you could be transformed. But you set these, these goals in your life. I know that I haven't reached my goal. But there's one thing I always do. Forgetting the past, that's good to do, huh? Sometimes we struggle with that. The past will keep you from even setting a goal, much less reaching it. So if you, if you let it. Forgetting the past and, and uh, straining towards what's ahead. I keep my eyes focused on the goal so that I may one day win the prize. So there's this reward connected to it that God has called me to receive through Christ in the life above. All of you who are spiritually mature should think in the same way. So he's, he makes a clear connection. Goals are part of our spiritual life, our spiritual discipline, to be goal-oriented, to have something in your eyes that are drawing you towards something. Your life will roll out either by design or default if you have no goals, You'll, you'll end up achieving just kind of being pushed around by other people and their wishes for you. When you have goals, you know what is important in your life. You know how to focus. And if, if you have no goals, you're really abdicating the control of your life, your spiritual life and other areas, and you end up just reacting or you're existing or you're drifting or you're coasting. The world is full of distractions, wouldn't you agree? And so if you don't have clear goals that you're set for yourself, you, it's too easy to be distracted and doing things that aren't worth doing. Not everything's worth doing. <laughs> How are you going to know what's worth doing and what's not worth doing? Because every time you say yes, you've said no to everything else. So goals help you to clarify what is important. So that's why it's a spiritual responsibility. But goals are also a statement of faith. As I said, it's not just for businesses or athletes. Certainly they do that, but, but for it, probably more important for, a, for a, a Christ follower. I need to have goals because when you are a believer in Christ, it becomes an act of faith. When you say, I am trusting, because for us, goals are about joining our efforts. It's not just on our own. I'm going to do this. God, you better help me. That's not what we're talking about. We're saying, without God, I'm going to fail. So this better be something God's all about. But, I, but it's a statement of faith. Hey, I am going to do such and such by such and such. That's a statement of faith. That's why the bigger the goal, the, bigger it, the more it can stretch your faith. And the more it can please God. Look at what the Bible says. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so if you have no goals... You don't need any faith. You're just existing. You're just drifting. You're getting kind of just wandering through life. That doesn't take faith to do that. But to say, hey, I'm going to go, even if it's counterculture, even if it's upwind, up the current, cross current. What I mean, the culture's pushing me this way. I'm going that way. But with God, I'm going to do it. There's faith involved. And the Bible says that pleases God. Whatever is not faith actually is sin. When you're not taking risks, when you're playing it safe, you don't need faith. You don't need God. That's why the Bible says, hey, let's call it what it is. You're just kind of living outside of faith and trusting in God. That's, that's sin. That's sin. We wouldn't naturally connect that to sin, right? We have our little list. What's sin? Well, it's this, this, this. How many of you would say not having goals? And yet God says we, he wants us to be stretched in our faith. Here is a great goal-stretching verse. Look at this verse. Love this verse. God can do anything, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or dare to request in your wildest dreams. Isn't that an amazing verse? Like, okay, okay, now we're talking. I mean, this is getting serious. God's saying you can dream big, and he'll dream bigger than you can. And so you go for something big. You stop the puny thinking. The little teeny, oh, if I could just have a little bit of this. My grandmother used to say that to me. She used to say, oh, if I just want a corner of a closet in heaven. That's small thinking, my friends, right? A corner. She, you know, 
See, the thing is, is if you have a big God, it's going to flesh itself out in big goals. You got a small God, it's going to flesh itself out in small goals. You got no God, that's really what it's going to, that's really what's going on. Oh, I don't have time for goals. Well, is that really what's at, what's at, at the core there? See, when you have a big God, you know it's not about you. So you stop the excuses. I'm too old, too young, don't have enough money. I'm not connected. I'm a man. I'm a woman. You know, I've, I've, I, I don't, I'm not educated enough or whatever. Or you, See, when you step into what God has for you, the excuses no longer apply because God says, I'm going to outdo it regardless of what you think you bring into the table. Because whatever we bring into a table, it's like a, you know, it's going to cost a million dollars and we're bringing our 10 bucks thinking, you know, I'm doing something. Well, you got $10. You aren't, you know, barely. Don't give yourself too much credit now. Don't limit what God can do through your unbelief. You start saying, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust him. Two common mistakes in goal setting. We set our goals too low. We try to accomplish goals too quickly. So when you're setting goals, our tendency is, is to like hedge our bets and make it real low where we really don't need to stretch our faith. We don't really need God. Or we do it too soon. And, 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 then, we, and then we haven't really given enough runway to see what God can do. So when you set goals on your, for your career, for your relationships, for your finances, for anything you want, for how you're going to look, how healthy you'll be, don't just set like a couple month goal. Set one that takes, you know, like a year or two or five or ten. You can do a lot more when you set a bigger goal. When I was 24 years old, I was in Arizona. And I set a goal to come out here to Virginia. I ended up staying here. I knew I was going to plant a church. So it's kind of merged in with that. I come out to Virginia. I'm 24. It's 1987. Show up. I have two suitcases. I had a house and I had a whole bunch of stuff. I sold it all. All my furniture, everything, my car, everything showed up. Stayed, first night, stayed at the YMCA, which is the blocker wide down at the Norfolk. They, they used to have rooms there you could stay. Stay there. Found a place I could just rent. And I, I set a goal to plant a church, which ended up being here. But my goal was I gave myself 30 years, 30 to 40 years, to plant a church, grow a church, impact a community, impact the world. If I just sent a one-year goal, that doesn't work too well. You know, because God, God, he blesses in these waves, and you give him time to work in your life. You set a deadline, but give yourself enough time. Don't set something real shallow, real small, and give, and, or too quickly. According to your faith, Jesus said, it will be done unto you. I love that because God says, hey, in this partnership of me doing miracles and helping you reach your goals, you play a big role. He goes, according to your faith, you want to see yourself grow and be transformed and expand your faith, there's going to be a point where you have to set some goals. Now, I know most people don't set goals. St statistics are 97% of Americans have no written down goals. So if I apply that to this group, I would be sad. And I don't want to be sad, so I'm going to pretend. All of you have like these, <laughs> these outstanding goals that every morning you get up, yeah, I'm going... Okay, I'm certainly praying that that is going to be more of our congregation by the end of this series. My goal today is to help you to see the value of goals. I've been praying for that. I'm talking, I'm pointing to what God says about it. And he says, hey, you need to go out on, the, go out on a limb where the fruit is. But it's risky out on the limb. I know near the trunk it's safe, but there's no fruit near the trunk. You've got to trust and walk out and, and climb out there. Number three, goals keep me going. Goals can give me hope. They move me forward. They help me to endure, help me to persist. It's not just because I'm bored with life. Well, I don't have anything to do. I guess I'll set a goal. Hey, well, that's better than nothing. But life has all kinds of things that come at us, 
and God, and, and part of it is, is you set goals to help you to focus, to help you to say, I'm going to stretch my faith. I'm going to keep growing. When we started over 20 years ago with our, uh, our missions and our sister church down in Mazatlan, they only had two feeding centers. Now they have like 19 feeding centers. And we had a medical team. At first, there was, we had no medical team. We have a medical team. And so we've always, we've been thinking over the years, you know, wouldn't it be awesome to have dentistry to bring? And God's brought us a dentist, Dr. Hamlin. And so she went with us last time. Here she is. I mean, we're just, that little kid's just like in a plastic, dirty chair, you know. It's a, you know, this, it's, it's good for both of them. They're both growing in this. But, but, but we have uh, uh, this dental clinic that we're building down there and uh and and we're going to equip it here's a clinic that's not, that's nearby that we're, we're working with them in partnership but you set goals because you can see the growth but this took over 20 years till we started seeing this reality what hap- what do you do when you're in a tough place in your life you keep going right you don't camp out in hell Right? I mean, when the Egyptian, when, when, when the Israelites were in Egypt, they had a goal to get out of Egypt. What was their goal? Go to the promised land, right? That's a pretty good goal. We're, we're, we're like in the worst possible scenario. We're in a different foreign country. We're enslaved. We have, we want a country of our own. It's a promised land. I mean, that was their goal. And that motivated them for 400 years all the way to get into the promised land. What about when the Israelites were in Babylon? Terrible place, foreign country again, basically enslaved for all intents and purposes. And what did they do? They had a goal to leave. We're going to go back and restore the temple and go back to our homeland. You, you don't make hell your home. You're in a tough spot. You're in a horrible place. Whatever it is, you keep going and goals help you to get through that and to get out of that. Jesus endured the cross because that was hell for him, literally. Endured the cross because he looked forward to the goal and the glory that was set before him. His goal was he went on a purpose. It was just a mindless journey through hell. It was, hey, I have a goal. Through this, I'll be able to redeem humanity. Now, your goal matters. What, not all goals are equal. You got to have a goal that is big enough, that or 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 uh, is um, challenging, or has a draw that will help you as you pursue your dream. Long-term goals keep you from being discouraged with short-term setbacks. Everybody has setbacks. We all blow it. We make mistakes. We have screw-ups, failures. In fact, it's really the only way that you succeed is you have, wow, well, that didn't work. That we're experts at knowing what doesn't work around here at our in, at Vineyard. I mean, we, we, that's how we stump. Most of what we do well is we stumbled upon it. Well, we mess that up. That's messed up. That's messed up. Okay, we got 99 of those. Oh, the 100th one, we finally figured it out. Now, hopefully you're learning from your mistakes. But if you have long-term goals when you have short-term setbacks, it doesn't, it doesn't throw you off kilter. It doesn't put you in a, in a rut or in a ditch. So you, you make sure you, you, you have something that's bigger than just the short term. And then also fail fast. In other words, you don't just stay there. You learn, you get up, you go. Because everybody learns. Everybody uh, makes mistakes, as I said. And so you view mistakes differently. You view mistakes as, hey, I'm... I'm learning what not to do. I'm getting educated. Some of you are highly educated. <laughs> you know a lot of things not to do. You know? The school of hard knocks, right? Trial and error. Well, that wasn't too smart. But goals help me to keep going. I don't get discouraged by short-term setbacks. I learn to fail fast. A goal doesn't have to be big to motivate you. Now, it can certainly be big, but sometimes big is relative. You just had major surgery. You're in the hospital bed. Maybe a good goal is just to sit up. And then the next goal after you do that is to put your legs over on the side of the bed. 
The next one is to get up and to be able to walk and go to the bathroom. That's a big one. They usually won't let you leave until they, it's like a threat at some point. And we're not letting you go until you can go pee. You know, dang, well, I just had all this anesthesia in me. I mean, uh, then next thing you know, you're walking around the hospital wing. Small goals can be powerful if they're meaningful to you. And then success isn't one big leap, but many small steps. Your ship rarely just comes in. It's like, you're going to build the ship. And you're starting with, you know, getting your lumber and getting your stuff you need. And so sometimes you just break it up into small steps and say, okay, what do I need to do? We've launched many, many churches uh, over the years in this church. And, uh, and so I have this conversation every time is I need to see a timeline. What are your goals? What do you want to do? And how should it roll out? Of course, it's not guaranteed it'll roll out like that. But you have to have some kind of idea. Hey, how do I know I'm making progress, that I'm moving forward? Because that's important. That's important. Job lamented. He, didn't ha- he was in a place, he was in hell and he didn't have any goals. Here's what he said. I do not have the strength to endure. I do not even have a goal that encourages me to keep going. Now, that's some of you. You're in a, t- in a bad place or you're, in a, you're stuck, you're miserable, whatever it is, and you don't even have a goal. You're kind of like Job. I'm just stuck here. And my goal for you is is that you would decide to set a goal. You would see it as this is part of my spiritual discipline. Some of you, you read God's word, you, you pray, you go to church, you fast, you give, but you have no goals. It's not complete, my friend. You need to add that to your spiritual portfolio. I have goals. I'm moving towards something. Because sometimes when we feel bad is when we need it the most. It's also often the hardest. When we're in a bad place, oh, woe is me. I'm not doing well. I'm stuck. It's like the lady, you have been married 30 years. Her husband dies. She has put on the tombstone. The light of my life has gone out. Three years later, she meets another guy, gets, falls in love, goes back, changes the tombstone. I struck a new match. <laughs> Some of you need to strike a new match. Sometimes we just fall into this, this tunnel and sentence ourselves to it. This is my new reality, and I'm going to live here forever. Well, nobody said that was, had to be you. So you realize, hey, no, goals are my spiritual responsibility. They're a statement of faith. They keep me going and keep me, get me out of bad places. What kind of goal does God bless? So you can't just grab any goal, right? Some goals are blessable by God. Some are not. They're just, they're just your own idea, whatever you think, you know. So you want to, as a Christ follower, we, we don't want to just pull goals out of the hat, right? We want them to be something God would bless. Bible says if your goals are good, you will be respected. I mean, look, the goals of Martin Luther King Jr., we, we have a holiday, you know, where we honor him and respect him. And he, he's known for setting big dreams and big goals. But they weren't goals all about himself. He didn't live for his own, you know, his own greed or his own pleasure, his own popularity. No, he was wanting to fight injustice, prejudice, racism, And he was fighting for truth. You set good, godly goals, and then you will be respected. So here's three kinds of goals that God blesses. One is you just ask the question, will this goal, if I reach it, honor God? Does it bring glory to God? Does it cause me to trust and depend on him so that when it happens, when it starts to become a reality, I can say it, I can point to God. It was God. Who's the one who got me here? I didn't do it all on my own. Does it cause me to serve God more, to love people more, to serve others more, to be more unselfish? These are the kinds of questions. God paid a great price for you, so use your body to honor God. So when we're honoring God with our body, we ask ourselves, am I living for pleasure or selfish reasons? Or, am I do- or, or what I'm doing with my body, is it honoring God even when the things we eat, it can be that simple. 
you know, and, and I think overall there's more awareness about healthy eating. And he says, when you eat or drink or do anything, so it's not just eating it, or do anything, always do it to honor God. So that means you can take out the garbage and honor God with it. You can wash the dishes and honor God. You can clean your car. You can study for a test. Uh, for years, I didn't know that. I mean, I, I came to Christ at 18, and I don't know, it was like maybe two or three years. I wasn't doing good in school. And then all of a sudden, I came across this verse and heard somebody talking about it. That changed everything. I started praying before my tests and asking God to help me to remember. Things. I mean, it transformed my grades, transformed the way I viewed education. But really, it's true with anything. A lot of it has to do with our perspective. You invite God into what you're doing. We make it our goal to please him. So will it honor God? Does it please him? And then secondly, is it motivated by love? When you're setting goals, financial goals, health goals, relationship goals, it's not motivated by greed. You know, I just want to make a lot of money. I just want to beat my competition. These kinds of things, you know, materialism, ego, pride. No, you say, it's what I'm doing, is it motivated by, by, by love? Or is it just materialism or just out of fear or, or out of a low self-esteem, all those kinds of things? No, God is in the process of teaching us how to love. The Bible says everything you do must be done with love. That's pretty clear, right? Everything you do, do it with love. Let love be, talking about goals, your highest goal. I was meditating on this, these verses and what I was going to say to you. And so I'm, I'm driving and all of a sudden I remembered I, when I became a pilot, I'm a private pilot. And when I, was, when I was in the cockpit and I was learning how to fly, uh, you have all these instruments. They're all pretty important, right? But there's one that is more important than all the other ones. It's in the center. It's called your, it's AI, but it doesn't mean that. It means attitude indicator. And it's before AI became, you know, a thing, right? And so I'd say, well, how can I look at that one more than other ones? And my instructor said, well, you teach yourself to scan. So you, you look at that your attitude indicator, then you look at your altimeter. Then you go back, look at your attitude indicator, and then look up and look at, you know, your, your uh, you know, one of these other instruments, you know, either your altitude or, you know, course correction or the direction you're going. I mean, it has, and so this is, this key one in the center is, is keeps you afloat, you know, in the air, you know. I mean, it's like your gyroscope. It has, like, the top part's blue, the bottom part's brown. It's like, that, that's the way I see this aspect of a love goal. In other words, you have all these goals. You have a relational goal. You have a marriage goal. You have a, a, a you know, if you're single, a, a goal for that. You know, your education goal. You have a, you know, a goal for your health or whatever. You have all these goals, but you always come back and say, but my, is it loving? Is this, am I, and, and always checking your motive, always checking what you're doing. Because if it's not built on love, it's not going to be blessed by God. And so we certainly want our goals to be blessed by God. Hopefully that made sense. It made sense to me. So thanks for listening. Uh, why have goals that are based on love? Why? Because if we don't base our goals on love, then we tend to treat people as, as objects, as projects, as ways to get what we want. So when we have loves that, when love is the basis of all of our goals, we're going to treat people differently as we're in our journey towards our goal. And that matters to God. And so climbing the ladder of success, you want a, what Michael Hyatt says, uh, who's a time management, energy management coach, he calls it a double win. I, I use his planner, so recently he, sent, he gave me a hat. It's a double win. I thought, what's that? I looked it up. He says, winning in only work is still a loss. You got to have a double win. You got to win at home. You got to win in your personal life. And you got to win in your professional life. Winning at one. And there's plenty of people that win at only one. And, then they, and the world will applaud them as though they're a success. That's not the way it works in God's kingdom. He wants you to have a double win. You need to make sure you win at home. 
and you win at work. You win professionally, you win personally. That's why love is so important. Will it require de depending on God? So will I, can I do this on my own or there's no way I can pull it off if God doesn't show up? Great question. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We looked at that. You need to have goals that require faith. We plan the way we want to live, but only God makes it us able to live it that way. During this series, I am going to be encouraging you, challenging you, praying for you to make and set goals. Trusting that God will give you the power and the energy and the ability, the wisdom, all the things you need in order to live this ordinary life that most people don't live. It's, the, it's an art more than a science. The art of living an ordinary life. And God provides you three things in order to reach your goals. Three things to reach your goals. Number one is I need to trust God's spirit to empower me. We're not talking about just willpower. I mean, probably all of us have set a goal of, you know, a weight goal or a nutrition goal. And, the, and, and then it just never really happens because we're depending on willpower. We need God's power. Trusting in God, say, God, I'm, you're gonna, you got to come through, with, through for me or it's not happening. You will not succeed on your own strength. Well, we know that. Or your own power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Can't change on your own. We need God's power. Number two is we need God's word. So God, the Bible is an integral part of our goal setting, of our goal keeping, of giving us clarity, uh, helping us move forward. And so we want to make sure and read God's word, study God's word. You know the difference between reading the Bible and studying the Bible? Studying the Bible means you have a pencil or a pen in your hand. You, if you don't have a pencil and a pen, and for me, some little glasses, you know, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. You're, but you're reading the Bible. Studying the Bible means I'm going to be underlining, circling, taking notes. That's different. And if you're not sure how to do that, we have, we have small groups that will help you to, 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 to learn that, that skill. To memorize even, and certainly to meditate. Joshua, I mentioned to you that the Is Israelites were in Egypt. That was a bad place in their life. God had given them this goal of the promised land, this dream. Joshua was the, the torchbearer. I mean, he was going to champion them going into the promised land. And the day before he did that, God says, keep this book of the law on your lips. Recite it day by day, by day and at night, that you will carefully follow all that is written in it. Then, so there's this promise. First, there's this premise, and, he goes, and this is how it's going to unfold. Then the promise, then you will successfully attain your goal. That's a pause on purpose. All right, I want that to take a moment. I've been chatting a lot, right? Successfully attain your goals by taking the time. In, in a way, it's counterintuitive, right? We're juggling all these things. We've got, you know, kids running them to school and got homework and we've got our job and we have all these responsibilities. And now we're going to add taking time daily to read God's word. It's like, I don't have that time. I'm, I'm too busy trying to meet my goals. He goes, well, don't, you don't look at it that way. You want to successfully attain your goal. You make sure and follow God's word. You make sure and take time soaking in God's word. That's why um, what the advice here is not, this isn't Tony Robbins or Brene Brown or Simon Sinek. This is God talking. Say, this is the way that we want to accomplish our goals. And then number three is I need God's people to support me. You'll never accomplish a great dream on your own. It just doesn't work that way. We do what we do to make the greatest impact as a team. As a team. And God gives us the church family so we can come alongside and make, because God has goals, as I said, for, for the world. He has goals for people, for, for humans. And part of the way he has designed to accomplish his goal is with us. And we come together. Now, listen, I like my goals. I, I want to accomplish my goals. But I think it's really important to help God accomplish his, especially if he's counting on me. 
He's invited me in. And so small groups is a big part of how we do that. That's where we come together. People know what you're going through, know you by name. And we're just starting our semester. It's a great time to get involved. You can do it online. You can uh, go out and sign up at the information desk. Another way to get involved in this church is through Grow Track. We do that every month. And the first Sunday, which is today, of each month, we do step one. It's step one, step two, step three, step four. It's only an hour long. And we watch your kids, give you something to eat. But more importantly, it's our opportunity to discover who you are, help you to join what God is doing through our church and impacting the world. And so we invite you right after this service to be part of that, to go right in. It's only, like I said, it's only an hour long. Step one, great time to get in. It says, by yourself, you're unprotected. But with a friend, you can face the worst. What a great verse. I mean, next week is the Super Bowl. And uh, the team that's going to win, I predict, is the team that knows how to really protect each other. They protect the quarterback. They protect the running back. They protect the wide receiver. I mean, they understand this is about protecting one another because that's where strength is found. And it's true for you and me. If you're not connected into a church body, you're unprotected spiritually. You're unprotected. You don't have people. That, in, our, in our small groups, in our church, we have, we have three things we try to accomplish. Connect, protect, and grow. We, wanna, we want you to connect in to meet people, to, you know, to grow in your relationships. But also we want to protect you in prayer, encouragement, in championing your goals, and then grow and help you and take your next step spiritually. And so that happens in a small group. And a group of three is even better because a rope braided with three strands is not easily snapped. Jesus said something similar right here. He said, if two of you agree to ask God for something in a symphony of prayer, that's the Passion Translation, symphony of prayer, my heavenly Father will do it for you. For whenever two or three come together in honor of my name, I am right there with them. This is a great way for things to change in your life. If you're stuck, if you're drifting, if you're coasting, it doesn't have to be that way. I want you to grow in your spiritual disciplines. Maybe it's a wake-up call. You, some of you thought you were good because you did some of those other spiritual disciplines. And God's speaking to you today and saying, no, there's an area that is still undeveloped in your life. I want you to set goals. I want you to... Uh, grow in that spiritual discipline to be able to help you through life, help you to make the most of life, not get so distracted, be able to be focused, and really stretch your faith because without God, it's not happening, right? Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Well, God, today we learned maybe something new for some of us about the value of dreams and goals real similar the difference between a dream and a goal is a goal is a dream with a deadline so plenty of us have probably have dreams but without a deadline it's only a dream and we want to step out in faith say God we declare we want to accomplish such and such by this date because we know it's our spiritual responsibility. It's going to stretch our faith. It's going to help me to keep going when things are difficult. Would you say, God, help empower me with your spirit? I can't do it on my own. This is not willpower. Would you say, God, help guide me through your word so that I, inside my soul, I yearn for things that will honor you that will that are motivated by love that 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 cause me to risk take for you even though it's scary would you say God I give you permission over these next seven weeks to transform me by the renewing of my mind 
make the rest of my life. This is all about the future, not the past. This series is about our future. Would you say, God, make the rest of my life the best of my life? If you've never asked Christ into your life, I talked to you a moment ago about how Jesus had the goal of going to the cross, dying for our sins. But there was a response that is required of us to recognize what he did, to confess our sins and say, God, thank you for dying on the cross. Forgive me. If you've never said that, that is your next step. That's what God's wanting you to do today. Right where you're at with every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm, God's at work stirring in your heart, stirring in your mind. If you're far from God today, you're saying, I want more of God. I want to be able to trust God. I want, I want God to guide me out of my own personal hell. Your first step is to declare your faith in Christ, to ask for God to forgive you. And I want to lead you in that prayer right now. If you're joining online or you're here in the physical auditorium, either way, I just encourage you just to pray where you're at. You can whisper it, whatever you're comfortable with. And, and, I, and, and just follow me in this prayer. If, you, if you're saying, I'm ready, I'm going to include me in that prayer, Andy. I'm ready to, to take that step. Then let me know just where you're at. Put your hand up just so that I can see it. Bless you. Okay. Yep, I see that. Okay, in the front, in the back, on the sides. Who else? I'll give you another minute. Okay, I see that. Yep, oh, thank you. Bless you. I see you halfway back. All right. Follow me. Put your hand down. Would you say, God, today, I surrender my life. Thank you for your amazing grace. I'll never earn. I can never be good enough to earn anything with you. The world is on trying to do that, trying to earn enough points. But you don't work on a point system. Say, God, I know you work on a grace system because everything that needs to be done was done on the cross. You say, God, forgive me for my sin. I look to the cross and what you did to pay for everything I ever did or will do. You say, also, God, cleanse me. Give me a fresh start. I want to join with you, God, and do your plan that you have for me. Today, I surrender my own personal goals that maybe I've set that aren't God-honoring, and I want to champion new goals. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you congratulate all those number of people and those of you online who made a decision for Christ? That is an awesome, awesome choice. It's a great step, step right into the right goal of using, letting God use you and work through you in remarkable ways. Well, if you're serving in the 11 o'clock service, thank you so much for doing that. You can get up, and I know our huddles are starting to form already. Thank you for serving and, 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 and uh, serving the body and serving our community in that way. Well, I mentioned to you we have growth track step one immediately following this service. If you've not been part of that, and maybe this is your first day, that's great. Uh, just come on in. You can learn more about the church. We can, we can talk to you. I'll be in there. Pastor Sharon will be in there. We'd love to just meet you and uh, tell you a little, bit more, a little bit more about the church and why we do what we do. And, uh, and that would begin your journey in discovering more of what God has for you, uh, especially how uh, you can be part of what God's doing uh, in our church, okay? Well, if you would, stand with me. We're going to go ahead and uh, transition to worship. I just want to say a word about giving that you can, if you're new with us, feel no pressure to give. We're glad that you're here. But if you would like to give, you can do that. Some ways you can text to give, online giving. The first Sunday of every month, I like to pray over those who financially support this ministry. Let me do that.
that now. Father, thank you for your favor on each one. Lord, I pray that you increase, increase uh, those who give. Lord, you protect them. You let things not wear out. Lord, I pray that you take the fish and loaves of what we give, not the, not the leftovers, but the first fruits, and you multiply that. Make it have a great impact. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.